Thank you very much indeed for coming along to the Libertarian Alliance meeting. And uh, today, Sean has uh, been kind enough to come along and give us a talk for the case for the landed aristocracy. But Sean says he'll have to define those terms within his talk. Uh, with that, Sean, can I hand it over to you? Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Be before, before I begin, do allow me to um, have a brief commercial introduction. Um, if you'd like to buy this wonderful novel, The Churchill Memorandum, you can buy it on Amazon. There is also this equally wonderful book by me, Freedom of Speech in England, Its Present State and Likely Prospects, available on Amazon. It's also available as a free download in PDF. Down. <laughs> on that basis. Yes. There, <laughs> then there are the books which, um, which really matter, I suppose. This marvellous epic by my dear friend Richard Blake was brought out by Hodder and Stoughton last month. A snip at £8.99 filled with hardcore violence, <laughs> bit of sex, a and, a, and a lot of libertarianism. Um, Richard Blake is probably the only uh, hardcore libertarian who is also a mainstream published novelist in this country. And so even if you don't like historical fiction, if you have £8.99 to spend, you could uh, do no worse than buying one of these to give as presents to those people for whom nothing else will do. That being said, however, let me get on with things. Now, can I have a time, please? Can anyone tell me what the time is? Uh, the time is now. 7.48. Okay, I need to be on the 9.40 from Charing Cross. I'm not driving today, so I'm at subject to the railway timetables. So I'll try to keep this short and succinct. I would ask David to shut me up after 40 minutes, and I'm sure that you'll have many things to say. Um, against me, or perhaps to ask a few questions. Now, the title that I absent-mindedly gave to David a few months ago was The Case for the Landed Aristocracy. And I think at the outset I should clarify, I should narrow my, um, the meaning that I attach to those words. Of course, I do not, indeed I cannot, uh, defend the existence of all or any particular landed aristocracies. Uh, most large-scale ownership of land originates in various kinds of violence, and many landed aristocracies throughout history have been thoroughly vexatious orders of people. And to defend landed aristocracy simply as a principle in itself would commit me to defending the landowning class of Republican and Imperial Rome, those people who owned vast tracts of land as absentee landlords and <coughs> farmed their land with herds of slaves. You could call them herds of slaves because they were treated as if they were herds of cattle with hideous underground prisons for those who didn't do exactly as they were told. I would find myself defending various corrupt South American <coughs> oligarchies uh, and all sorts of deeply unpleasant, I won't use the word unlibertarian, just deeply unpleasant and inhumane and anti-civilization orders of people. The landed aristocracy that I am interested to defend is simply the old landed aristocracy of this country, the English aristocracy. I think that there is a very strong case which can be made for the existence of the old order as it was before 1914, and perhaps as, in a rather ghostly sense, it was until a time within our own lifetimes. I, I know that David is a strong Cobdenite, and as Cobden said after the repeal of the Corn Laws, we've got free trade in goods, now let's go after free trade in land. And there's a strong anti-landlord, anti-aristocratic element in a lot of English classical liberalism. I do think that that is 
a misguided view of the world, and I look forward to uh, a brisk exchange of views with David in due course. Before I go to a defence of the landed aristocracy in England, however, let me give a brief, indeed a very potted history of Europe in the late, between the later Middle Ages and the early modern period. Um, I, I think European history in the 14th, 15th and 16th centuries is, is best understood as a series of reactions to two underlying forces. On, on the one hand, there is the end of the medieval warm period. After about 1320, give or take a, a generation, uh, temperatures began to drop throughout the world. It's very difficult to know what temperatures were at any one time. It's certainly difficult to work out average global temperatures. But there is a great deal of evidence to suggest that um, temperatures cooled markedly during the 14th century. The, the second force is the simple Malthusian pressure of numbers. Um, yes, the end of the medieval warm period led to increasing difficulties with food supply. The West European population was not very well adapted to, to deal with falling harvest yields. It was not very well set up to deal with colder winters. The, the, the European society as a whole was not very well set up to deal with the increasing pressures, the increasing difficulties rather, of growing enough food to feed existing numbers of people. This pressure was greatly this pressure was greatly relaxed in the 1340s and 50s with the arrival of the Black Death, which killed about a third of the world's population. It seems to have killed between 30 and 40 percent of the English population, and we can probably say that it did much the same in the rest of Europe. And although temperatures continued to cool throughout the 14th century, the sudden drop in population relieved all of the <coughs> usual Malthusian pressures that would otherwise have resulted. And the result was that the end of the 14th century and the first half of the 15th century were, generally speaking, good times for ordinary working people in Europe. They were not good times for landed aristocrats who found the, well, sorry, landed aristocrats this was an age of civil war and of European wars, and landed aristocrats suffered the natural consequence of that. It was not a good time for the gentry in England or their counterparts in the rest of Central Europe because the price of labour had risen. But it was remarkably good times for ordinary people. If you've read the works of Ferdinand Brodel, you will see that um, ordinary people during the 15th century lived extremely well. In, indeed, I have seen a set of indices um, which take the year 1400 as 100. And the index rose gradually to about the middle of the century, then went into a gradual decline. This decline became precipitate during the 16th and 17th centuries, bumped along the bottom in the 18th century, and only turned strongly upwards from the middle of the 19th century onwards. I'm talking about prices in England, by the way, and the index is constructed by looking at the price of grain and looking at the purchasing power of the salaries of building workers in London, bricklayers. Uh, if you take that index, which appears to be reflective of what was happening throughout much of Western Europe, uh, ordinary people had rather good times in the first half of the 15th century. It thereafter got steadily worse. It only reached the level of the first half of the 15th century from about the 1880s onwards, before which there had admittedly been very strong growth, and after <coughs> which there has been very strong growth. But the whole period 
uh, let's say 13, 1450 to 1850, was rather a bad time to be an ordinary person in Western Europe and certainly in England. Governments, governments came under particular strain because of these pressures, uh, cooling temperatures and Malthusian pressures. The pressure was taken off by the Black Death and gradually crept upwards again. Governments came under pressure. Um, bad times meant a greater than usual tendency to things like religious mania and political instability. Uh, differences which could otherwise have been negotiated away became subjects for armed conflict between various groups. You, you can explain much of the political and military history of Europe in the late Middle Ages and early modern period simply by looking at uh, the average temperatures and the growth of population, the, the Malthusian pressure against a ceiling which remained obstinately at one level for a very long time. Governments responded to this by centralizing, by simplifying uh, and consolidating themselves. And this meant, in much of Western Europe, the growth of absolutism, which could be seen as the increasingly unfettered power of the king, but it's probably better to be seen as a joint venture between a centralizing monarchy and a bureaucratic class um, of a, a, bu a bureaucratic class of largely middle-class people. You, you can see this at its most extreme in France. In the 17th century, all of the uh, constitutional checks and balances, such as they had been, which had survived from the Middle Ages, were either swept away or rendered inactive by various kinds of royalist activism. And the Royalist project had two parts. The first was to neutralize the existing landed aristocracy. The problem, if you are a centralizing absolutist monarch with a, with, with a landed aristocracy, is that you are dealing with people who do not consider themselves very much to be your social inferiors and who are an alternative power base to your own. And so you neutralize them in various ways. The French state's way of neutralizing the French aristocracy was to require it to dance attendance on the king at Versailles. Uh, living at Versailles involved you in enormous expense. It also took you away from any kind of organic contact with your tenants. Uh, and so Increasingly, after about 1660, the French aristocracy became a parasitic growth on the French nation, which was eventually swept away in the Great Revolution, which also swept away the monarchy itself. It was different in England. It was different in England for a number of reasons, which I don't need to go fully into. One of these reasons, however, was that England is an island which has been able, for the most part, to dominate the, 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 only other, um, the only other territory with which it has to share this island, namely Scotland. And so there was never any great pressure on the English government to have a large standing army. Even so, the Tudor monarchy was modestly centralizing <coughs> and modestly absolutist. The Tudor monarchy governed England through a set of rather middle-class councils. The Council of Star Chamber, for example, um, various subcommittees of the Privy Council, the Council of the North. These were bureaucratic councils staffed by middle-class office holders, which enforced basic price controls, basic wage controls, were able to enforce monopolies that have been sold by the Crown. Um, they were able to govern the country without too much reference to the common law courts. The great break 
in English constitutional history came in 1641 when all of this conciliar government, all of the Tudor and early Stuart attempts at an absolute centralized state were swept away. And, and, and suddenly there, there was no force left able to govern the country except the common law courts and um, various local strongmen. At first, this led to the rule of the saints. Anyone who regards uh, the 1640s and 50s as a golden age for English liberty, I think, is um, looking at that age through rose-tinted spectacles. It was an age of religious fanaticism, of increasingly close, though not always effective, regulation of lifestyle. We've all heard how the Puritans cut down the maypoles how they tried to make adultery punishable by death. We've heard about the um, unusual number of witches who were hanged in this country during the 1640s and 50s. The, the general lunacy of the class of men who governed this country. The great reaction of 1660 when the Stuart King was brought back was not actually a reaction. The King was brought back but the reality was an aristocratic coup in this country. Before the 1640s, the aristocracy was by no means supreme in this country. As I said, power was often exercised locally through uh, great hereditary landlords. It was exercised by the gentry who formed the body of the magistrates but there were also the central councils to which all of these uh, gentry and noble interests were answerable in various ways. Once these were swept away, the aristocracy emerged in 1660 as the greatest social and political force in the kingdom. I indeed, when I say that 1660 was a, an aristocratic coup, um, all of the feudal tenures which had vexed noble families for generations, indeed, sen uh, indeed centuries, were swept away. Um, under, one of, under the old feudal tenures, um, well, it was possible for an adventurer to take himself off to court, to the court of James I or Charles I, to charm his way into the king's good books, and the king would then send a letter to a wealthy landowning aristocrat saying, this young man is a very fine person, um, marry, marry your daughter to him. <coughs> that was one of the feudal tenures. The aristocracy held land subject to various tenures from the crown, and um, one, of these, one of the conditions was that uh, unmarried daughters were required to um, marry whomever the king provided. In 1660, all of that swept away. The, aris the landed aristocrats found themselves owning their, owning their land in much the same way as you or I might own a modern freehold. Um, it was subject to the theoretical ownership of the king as the great uh, feudal landlord, but really and truly these were freeholds in, in fee simple. You, you um, paid a few peppercorn dues and that was it. At the same time, although the feudal obligations of those below the aristocracy were swept away, these feudal tenures were not abolished, they were transformed into tenancy agreements. And so, in 1660, you saw the emergence of an extremely wealthy and small landed aristocracy which owned most of the country. And these people became the landlords of a very large class of tenant farmers. Most of the rights and responsibilities, sorry, the rights of ownership were upheld. The responsibilities of ownership were swept away in the great revolution of 1660 that ended the various feudal tenures. And after 1660, England became an aristocratic country. Before the Civil War of the 1640s, 
Yes, it was often the case that the elder sons of peers would serve a term in the House of Commons before, take, before inheriting their father's title. But after 1660, it became an established custom whereby the Commons was filled up very largely with the, younger, with the elder sons, the younger sons, the cousins, the nominees of landed aristocrats. Andrew Marvell was one of the last of the old-style uh, members of Parliament. He lasted well into the 1670s. He was a man without land. He was a man without any, any means of his own. He's famous nowadays as a poet. He was one of the last members of Parliament who collected a salary from his constituents. Uh, until the 1640s, it was very common for members of Parliament to be rather humble men and to be sent into Parliament to represent their local, uh, to, to represent their local communities and to be paid expenses and a salary. After the 1660s, with the great influx of uh, noble relatives and noble nominees into the Commons, the idea of paying members of the House of Commons uh, faded away. As I said, Andrew Marvell was one of the last men to claim any kind of salary from his constituents because increasingly the House of Commons was filled up with men of considerable means who would have thought it rather humiliating to accept expenses and certainly a salary from their constituents. You, you, you have a withering away of many constituent bodies. But, but I, I could go into that in much greater detail. Now, that is the reality of what happened in 1660. Yes, we brought back the dead king's son. We stuck a crown on his head. We, we hung drew and quartered the surviving, the surviving judges who had cut off the head of Charles I. But the reality was not any kind of restored Stuart absolutism. It was an aristocratic coup. And one of the reasons why James II was kicked out so sharply in 1688 was partly because he was a Roman Catholic and he tried to subvert the fundamental laws of the realm by, with the advice of various wicked persons, including Jesuits, etc., but the real reason James II was kicked out was because he broke the deal made in 1660. From the later years of Charles II and an accelerating pace during the reign of James II, the Stuarts began to reconstruct an administrative state. Now, when I was an undergraduate at York about 150 years ago, I... I wrote one of my long essays on a man called Leoline Jenkins. He is regarded with great contempt in most of the histories of the 1670s and 80s. He was one of the most um, fervent supporters of the divine right of kings. He, as, um, a, a, as a member of parliament and a member of the Privy Council, he alone faced down the anger of the House of Commons when he tried to resist the various exclusion bills to stop James II from becoming King of England after his brother Charles died. But Leoline Jenkins was no fool. He was a very clever man, a self-made Welsh peasant. He came from a very humble background. He got into a good school through various scholarships, got himself to Oxford. He was a very distinguished Roman lawyer, not... Uh, a common law lawyer. He was a very distinguished Roman lawyer. And he was the most prominent and the most able representative of a new class of middle class administrators being put together in the later years of Charles II and throughout the reign of James II. As I said, absolute monarchy is a joint venture between the king and a group of middle-class officials, and the later Stuarts were trying to put together the same kind of class of middle-class officials as Louis XIV used in France. James II was kicked out in 1688, and the aristocratic coup 
which took place in 1660 was absolutely <coughs> confirmed in 1688. The revolution settlement laid down as a fact of life that the aristocracy in this country was the ultimate ruler of this country. The rights of the people were simply a collateral advantage in this process. The king was made subject to the House of Commons, yes, but the House of Commons itself was run by the aristocracy. Now, the libertarian implications of this. The English aristocracy had, as a class, nothing more to wish for after 1688. It had got everything it wanted. These people ran the country. Whatever they wanted, they got. You want to hang someone for killing a rabbit on, his, on the land he rents? Yes, you've got it. You want to make sure that all the king's ministers are people from your own order? You've got it. You want to run the House of Lords? You've got it. You want to dominate the House of Commons? You've got it. What more could these people want? Nothing. They weren't stupid. They, know, they knew they'd won. An expanded government? No, because an expanded government meant middle-class officials, and it meant the same kind of process as had taken place in France, people like Colbert and the various uh, middle-class men who had pushed aside the great landed aristocrats, or it meant more people like Sileline Jenkins in this country, uh, people from nowhere, people without connections, people who hung on the king, and who could be trusted to stand by the king, whatever he did. No, you don't want that. You don't want officials. You don't want any kind of administration. And so as we passed into the 18th century, this country passed under the government, uh, government virtually atrophied. The purpose of government was simply to obey the law. That there was no administration in the modern sense. By the end of the 18th century, after a modest growth in the size of government during the Napoleonic Wars, the Home Office had the Home Secretary, a few Under Secretaries, and a few dozen clerks who were paid a pittance and whose job was simply to copy dispatches. Well into the 19th century, Lord Palmerston's Foreign Secretary uh, had to write out his own letters to foreign ambassadors. In 1820, the French Ministry of the Interior employed 20,000 officials. The British Home Office, its counterpart, employed a few dozen broken down clerks. This was not because the ruling class in this country were committed believers in laissez-faire, but simply because the aristocracy which ran this country did not want any kind of middle-class administration over which it would have no control. These people had seen what had happened in France. They had seen what happened briefly in this country during the 1630s and again during the 1680s, and they wanted none of it. The whole country could be government was, as I said, largely obedient to the common law. Parliament did not bother making many laws. Uh, indeed, most, most radicals did not look to government as the solution to any problem. Sidney Smith, in 1802, was against factory legislation, not, again, because he was a committed believer in laissez-faire, but simply because he believed that any act to regulate factories would not regulate factories, but would become a, a set of sinecures for aristocratic hangers-on. Now, having given this long background, let us look at what happened in the 19th century. Did we advance towards democracy during that century? I suppose in a degraded sense we did. But, um, I think very often we are still the victims of the debates held by the Victorians themselves. On the side of people like Cobden and Bright, 
you have a middle class agitation, or if you're a chartist, you have a working class agitation to secure the rights of the ordinary people of this country to have a final say in the government of this country. On the other side, you have people like Lord Salisbury with their worries about the nature of democracy. Uh, Victorian conservatives seem for the most part to have believed that if we established manhood suffrage in this country, it would lead straight to socialism. And it would lead, what would happen is that the newly, enfra the newly enfranchised working men would vote for working class demagogues who would bring about an immediate confiscation and, and a general leveling of society. Liberals like John Stuart Mill were rather worried that this might be the case. And during the, during the chaotic debates in the middle of the 1860s over the franchise extension, you have conservatives and conservative classical liberals suggesting any number of fancy franchises so that, yes, the six-pound householders, they could have the vote, but um, if, you have, um, if you have a university degree, you'll be able to have a vote in your own constituency and a vote in the constituency where you went to university. Um, rate payers, business rate payers will have a double vote. Um, education and wealth will give people more than one vote. We shall have uh, one man, one vote, but, uh, well, actually, no, we shan't. We'll have one working man, one vote, but one middle class man, two or three votes. Uh, and the, the attempt was to square their belief in extending the suffrage with their terror that extending the suffrage would lead to. Um, would lead to the election of demagogues by ig poor and ignorant voters. And so that was the debate during the 19th century over democracy and the extension of the franchise. The, the truth, of course, now that we are 150 years beyond this, was different. As soon as we had manhood suffrage, after the 1880s, you didn't have the House of Commons flooded with men in cloth caps preaching land nationalisation and calling for a guillotine to be set up in Trafalgar Square. Democracy was a sham, and always has been a sham, and was a sham for obvious reasons. The working classes do not on the whole want a revolution. But the working classes as a whole are not interested in politics. The, the working classes may occasionally say, yes, you know, we want a say in the government of this country, but power belongs to those people who are willing to take it and to keep it. And uh, those of us, I'm not one, those of us who came into politics via the left Although many of the tricks used by uh, leftist cliques to take power in supposedly broad front organisations, you know about how to uh, raise endless trivial points of order until ordinary people clear off. You then make sure that you're just above the quorum and you pass your motions, you take over. Because you're not married, because you're willing to sit up all night Rodeoing leaflets, you get yourselves elected to committee positions, and behind a facade of democratic solidarity, you, you have an extremely unrepresentative small clique exercising actual power. And, and that is what happens with democracy as a whole. For as soon as the landed aristocracy in this country began to give way in a significant sense, from the 1880s onwards, you do not have a growth of working class representation in Parliament. What you have is a transfer of power from landed aristocrats who have no particular interest in interfering with the lives of ordinary people because their lives are already very nice, thank you very much. A transfer of power from them 
to middle class functionaries who start making all sorts of regulations. Regulations partly because they believe that they are much better at running people's lives than people are themselves, and regulations because it means more officials, which means more employment for themselves and their friends. And that is the history of the 20th century. Great, I'll finish in a moment. The, the, 20th the history of the 20th century was not a history of increasing democratization. It was simply the completion of a process that began in about the 1880s, perhaps the 1860s, a transfer of power from an hereditary landowning aristocracy to middle class officials who, because of their own particular interests, saw no reason for government limitation. The working classes never got to look in except occasionally to turn up and vote. You, you can vote for middle class busybody A or middle class busybody B. That's it. <laughs> the, the loss of English freedom coincided with the destruction of the landed aristocracy. Many of the landed aristocrats, I would say, were thoroughly sound libertarians, many more so than many of the middle class radicals. You have people like Lord Harvey in the 18th century. I, I read his memoirs some years ago, and I'm currently reading them again in a longer version. Solid libertarian. You then have the mainstays of the Liberty and Property Defence League, people like Lord Elko, landed aristocrat, solid libertarian. These were the people who guaranteed our freedom, partly because they were often ideological libertarians, but also because their interests did not lie in an expanded government. We have lost our freedoms in the age of democracy, not because the working classes have risen up and said, we want a health and safety law that will employ 350,000 inspectors, we have lost our freedom to various middle-class interest groups which have manipulated the institutions of state behind a fig leaf of democracy to transfer absolute and unaccountable and unlimitable power to themselves. And for that reason, I would suggest that any view we may hold of the English landed aristocracy as somehow not entirely friendly to libertarian ideals is worth reconsidering. With that, I'll thank you for, indulgent, for your indulgence and sit down. Is there any questions? Any questions for Sean? One of the things you said uh, was that um, living conditions for um, uh, I think it was bricklayers uh, and building workers living in London uh, from through the 1450s uh, improved as their um, purchasing power, the ability to purchase grain, went up compared to the actual price of grain. Uh, and so they had a very good living standard through that period and started the claim during the uh, during the 1860s, 1880s, and. Was it later on than that? No, what I'm saying is that ordinary working people, so far as we can tell, did very well after the Black Death until population began to recover. Population was rising, temperatures were falling, the Malthusian ceiling wasn't rising, it was falling, and so living standards were squeezed again during the 16th century, and ordinary people's living standards remained below the level of the 15th century well into the 19th century. That seems to be the case in England, for which we have the best statistics. It may have been the case in much of Western Europe. Could that um, sort of improvement have been down to the strength of guilds during that period? Uh, you've got the worshipful company of mm. London bricklayers or something like that, uh, which during that period maybe had uh, a... Um, uh, an economic stranglehold on the ability to uh, control construction work within London, mm. and then lost it towards the end of that period. Because that not be the, the you know the cause of this uh, this improvement for builders mm. that you saw, uh, 
that isn't necessarily carried through to, to other people living in the same area? Oh, the economic statisticians are rather more sophisticated than that, but um, the, the improvement in living standards seems to have been the laws of supply and demand, and the subsequent demand decline of living standards was, again, due to the laws of supply and demand. Yes? Um, okay, so you're saying that the landed aristocracy is the, well, it was the counterweight to the middle class busybodies. The landed aristocracy isn't going to come back to be that counterweight, unless, well, I could be wrong, but I, I doubt that very much. Do you see that being a potential counterweight in the working class, as you mentioned, the people that aren't interested in politics? Could that be mm. um, where, where, where we can hope for support, maybe under a system of direct democracy rather than the sham democracy we have? I've spent most of my life as a high Tory and a libertarian. I like the old constitution. And I respect the old landed aristocracy, but I accept your point. It's gone, it's been destroyed, it can't come back. Oh, a, a lot of the land in England is still owned by trusts which um, are front, fronts for the landed aristocracy. But the landed aristocracy, as it existed right down to the Great War, has been shattered and scattered, and it will not come back as a united political force. Uh, and so for that reason, I, as a high Tory, find myself increasingly drawn towards various kinds of decentralist anarchists who, who, who um, want to destroy power or to decentralize it. People like Kevin Carson, Keith Preston, uh, I suppose Hans Hermann Hopper. Um, I, I find myself drawn increasingly into those various kinds of radicalism, even though I would really like to set the clock back to 1914 with modern dentistry and the internet. But you see, since that's not an offer, we have to go forward. Okay. Any other speakers? Anyone else? No. Just, well, well, uh, Bob might have a question. <coughs> Bob, have a question? Oh. Well, in that case, <laughs> so can I just? Yes. So, so. Would, would you not say that the landed aristocracy that you talk of has actually taken the form of the monarchy as it was back then, um, in the sense that they've sort of learned how to use the bureaucracy to maintain, you know, land holdings or whatever? I, I don't know if I'm making. You know, it's making any sense. Say more. Um, oh, geez, I, 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 <laughs> not the best public speaker, but um, they've learned how to use the bureaucracy in the same way that the kings used it in the 16th century. So, you know, as you spoke earlier, um, you know, they've, they've learned how to use bureaucracy to their own benefit. Hmm. And as such, they have no interest in turning. In, in the same way that you, you look at a big company today or these huge conglomerates that use bureaucracy to sort of entrench their market position, would you not say that? Yeah. Are you sort of understand? Are you getting my point? Yes, I'm getting a point. Um, let me give you an answer which will be rather simplistic because it's going to be short. I have the greatest respect for the old landed aristocracy. I regard the corporate elites and plutocrats in general with hatred and contempt. And yes, the corporate elites and the plutocrats use the institutions of an extended and absolute state to, um, to entrench their positions. The landed aristocracy is slightly different so far as the effective deal between the surviving aristocrats and the modern state is this. Lord whatever his name, so long as his great-grandfather didn't get his head blown off in the Great War and, and suffer the death duties, as long as his grandfather didn't uh, crash his Spitfire in 1940 and suffer the death duties, Lord whatever, 
who has managed to survive into the second decade of the 21st century with his estates semi-intact, is left alone. He enjoys a great deal of social respect. The condition is that he doesn't get involved in politics. He doesn't make a nuisance of himself. You don't have people, you don't have aristocrats in politics like Lord Elko of the Liberty and Property Defence League, or Lord Derby, or um, who was the who was the Lord who was very heavily involved in Nigel Meek's Society for Individual Liberty? Lord um, was it Lord Monson? I can't remember. Or, or Lord Suderley, who is about a hundred and five and is one of the mainstays of the uh, mainstays of the traditional Britain group. These people are not tolerated nowadays. The deal is that they're left alone with their titles and their land, and they do not interfere with the government of this country. They do not get involved in campaigns against the modern state. Um, that's the deal. Bob? Uh, is it altogether wise uh, for a libertarian to speak of running in the country? Yes, of course it is, Paul. I want to take over the country so I can leave you alone. <laughs> Surely the aristocrats thought that the world went by itself. Yes. As long as people don't get excited about who owns what, as long as it's legally got, well, we don't do much at all, do we? Wasn't that was surely their view? Yeah, and compared with the people, compared with the rubbish who rule us nowadays, that's a very fine view of the world, isn't it? <laughs> but it's not running the country. It's ensuring the country isn't run at all. I mean, in one way. Even better. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We're in agreement, yes. Hmm. So, yeah, so, any other people to speak yet? Just I was, sorry, I was really addressing the amount of war, so yeah. well, um, while the, the, the aristocracy weren't interested in running the country, that wasn't because necessarily they were libertarian, it's just that they didn't want in, anyone else to interfere with their running of their estates mm -hmm. and their management of the other people living on it. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily uh, that there wasn't government. Uh, it's just that it wasn't government on a national scale so much as it was more government on a on a local scale or regional scale managed by the aristocrats, surely. I'm not sure they did much. <laughs> Ten harvest festivals or... And that's about it. And, and you see, David, this is where your worship of Richard Cobden and co it is so misguided. Well, because I, don't, I don't agree with Cobden on class. I mean, but, you've heard my views on yes, class. No, but these are the My views on class are class... Class analysis is a stupid analysis. These are the people, That's why Carson's stupid. Yeah, no, but these are the people who joined in the attack on the landed aristocracy, which turned out, for all its faults, to be the uh, the only guarantors of our freedom. Well, if you if you have a look at uh, Cobden's works, he wasn't interested in attacking the aristocracy. Of course, he did think that the aristocracy supported the warmongering government, mm. and he did he did take up from Adam Smith uh, the analysis that. Uh, the aristocrats, the aristocrats could afford the war. They didn't think of the cost. You know, this was basically the liberal analysis. Uh, but, but, but if you have a look through Cobden's writings, he, very rarely does he attack the aristocrats as the aristocrats. Basically, he attacks imperialism, the British state, what it's doing, expanding and sticking its nose in everyone's business apart from the business which is it's supposed to be its domain, like England and Ireland. And he, Cobden, as I said before the meeting, uh, was uh, a classical liberal. He thought the government had its proper place. He wasn't an anarcho liberal, as many of us here are in the LA. And um, he thought the government had its place, and he thought that one of the places the government had was in education, uh, because he himself had had a very bad experience in a private school. And when Dickens' books uh, came out uh, about the private school, uh, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas, Nicholas Nickleby, that's right, yes, Cobden said, my school was exactly like that, and that's why I hate private schools. So he had a, a prejudice against private schools, he had a prejudice against, uh, in favour of uh, state education, uh, but he wasn't particularly against the aristocracy. He was against the state, and he was mainly against the state because of the problem of war. And that's where, I wouldn't say I worship Cobden, um, but that's where Cobden and I have a great affinity, because I, I also am... Uh, uh, in hate, if you like, with politics because of the problem of war and especially the needless killing of people around the world and uh, people being taxed to do this. 
And it's as near as, as can be to, to madness, in my opinion. And Cobden had that view, and, and that was Cobden's... Uh, I don't think he was particularly against the old aristocrat. He wouldn't oppose what you said or what Bob said. Uh, Cobden is interested in uh, getting rid of imperialism, uh, cutting down the state, getting free trade to crowd out war. Uh, that, that, that's basically Cobden's... But he did have a... Uh, he, did, well, he, was, he did love Parliament. That's where I put me and Cobden disagree. And um, he did uh, have uh, one or two uh, ideas as to his limited state. I think he was wrong on all of those. Uh, but uh, he, didn't know, he, he did have class analysis as well, and he was utterly wrong on that. How much had Henry George's writings to do with the attack upon the United States? And was it really believed, or was it believed by some, or was it made use of by the Liberals and others to um, put the political advantage? It made a great impact on socialism. <laughs> oh, um, Bob, your question largely answers itself, I think. Uh, there were committed Georgists right, right into the 1920s, 20s and 30s. They never got anywhere. Um, the reason they didn't get anywhere was because Henry George's idea was of a much smaller state, and the people who took up his ideas... I think simply wanted to, they simply wanted to knock the aristocracy aside so that they could take over the leaders of power. And so the negative side of George's message, which was the illegitimacy of landed property, was very convenient. The positive side, which was to cut all taxes except a single tax on land and go for strong laissez-faire, was completely ignored. I, I think you're right. It was. Uh, Georgism was an early legitimizing ideology for the takeover by the new class, just as uh, traditional laborism of the first half of the 20th century was just a convenient legitimizing ideology, which was in turn discarded in favor of whatever we have at the moment. Environmentalism, uh, multiculturalism, globalism, you name it. It's funny how ide the, the dominant ideologies in this country during the past 120 years have all required a large and uh, powerful and well-paid class of administrators. The moment any of these ideologies parts company with the interests of this class, it is discarded. <laughs> You're saying that the, the people who are sort of um, uh, running the country are completely cynical uh, in their posturing to uh, basically to, uh, yeah. Th though it is a feature of liars and charlatans often to believe what they're saying. Uh, I mean, um, if you are a liar, it helps enormously if at the time of lying, you, you believe what you're saying. But many of them are rather cynical, I have no doubt. I don't think Peter Mandelson is in any doubt over what um, the purpose of his life has been. Tony Blair might go and deceive himself. If I were Tony Blair, I'd want to deceive myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I sort of get the point that you're making. You, okay, well, you, you can speak as much as you wish. You could say there never has been mass politics, only mass propaganda. It doesn't really matter to try to get the mass because it just whoever controls the system will tell tell them what to think. Yeah. In a in, simplif in, the, in a simplification. So what matters most for Libertarian is not so much to try to get the message to the masses and finally one day they will get it. Because first it's quite obvious, nobody will really disagree, won't fair effect. And second, nobody really care, and it never really applied by no. mass takeover. Mm. So, as you said, what matters most is when they get a crisis and they could bankrupt, it just to break the power, so yeah. we have more decentralized power. Mm. Um, the McDonough, Leicester, Metton, Layson Libertarian Alliance still, I think, holds fairly true to the the 1981 pamphlet uh, about we we gain intellectual hegemony and then victory follows from that. I must say that uh, the Gad Meek uh, 
Davis LA has given up on that because we think that the kind that intellectuals are inherently statist and we shall forever knock our heads against a brick wall trying to bring these people over. But uh, you see, unlike your LA, we don't have a very clear idea of how we're going to win. Well, you see, I think, uh, you know, just cynicism is, is, is uh, bankrupt, I think. Uh, Keynes was brilliant at this in the last uh, page of the general theory, mm. uh, where he said that uh, it's not... Uh, of course, uh, there are some people, I think, actually, I think Jan, rather, uh, has often in the past gone along with this mm. stupid, I think it's a stupid view, of, of, of uh, uh, economic interests. It is not the economic interest, as, as Keynes uh, explained, but in fact the ideas that the rule the roost. And uh, you, 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 you won't get a situation of, like, like you uh, explained a few moments ago, that when money pours out of something, the ideas will collapse. This will never happen. The environmentalist ideas have emerged uh, through, uh, if you like, they've emerged naively through actual... Uh, people misunderstanding and thinking that there are real big problems out there. Now, whether these are right or wrong is a matter of fact. Uh, and again, the idea of socialism is a common sense idea that, 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 uh, that, that if you don't understand the antidote to it, which of course is Mises' economic calculation argument, may well make a lot of sense. It promises to be exactly the same as libertarianism promises to be a, a problem of the uh, of unemployment, communism will get rid of unemployment, it will get rid of war, it will make a better place. And of course, your, your idea that the, that, the, that the statisticians have done a good job on history, I mean, when I look at the colleges and I look at the various departments of the colleges, I don't know which I hate the most. I certainly hate the bloody lot of them. Psychology, sociology, they're two terrible things. Statistics, completely confused. Historians seem to be the worst of the lot. I think the old Whig interpretation of history uh, that uh, each generation leaves a legacy for the next generation, and so we tend to make progress because of this legacy left, mm. is correct. And it's put in its economic terms by Julian Simons, the ultimate resource. Mm. Which, have you read that book? I have. Mm. Let, me, let me answer very quickly, because I'm afraid the railway timetables are against me. Um, I, disagree, I, I disagree with David's quotation from Keynes. I, I, I accept that ideas are of very great importance and are an autonomous force to some extent. But I think the world is ultimately ruled by those people who want to obtain a good life by seizing power over society. And to a very large degree, these people use whatever legitimizing ideology is most convenient to hand. Uh, if you look at Keynesian economics, stripped away of all the obfuscation, they are absurd. Why is it that Keynesian economics has become so utterly dominant? E e even during the 1980s, when many of us thought that the, 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 the whole system had collapsed, the, the reason why Keynesianism has been so important during the past 70 odd years is because it is a legitimizing ideology, a very sophisticated legitimizing ideology for the rule of the people who rule us. And the reason why environmentalism is crumbling it is partly because it is so manifestly absurd, but, but also because it doesn't do the job. It doesn't do the job of legitimizing the power of those who rule us. So that's a rather pessimistic view of things, but it's what I've come to at the moment. Yeah, I think it's a false, false one. If you want to be optimist, uh, read, uh, read the books that uh, explain optimism, The Ultimate Resource, The Rational Optimist by Matt Woodley. We've read those two books. Yes. I think the, those books are right. And uh, you know, I, I think that, that, that no matter who is in power, See, the thing is that power costs money. Power is uneconomic. Power itself is uneconomic. Uh, when great families try to get power, like the case, they have to put a hell of a lot of money into it. And they generally lose that money, and they generally get little, uh, 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 little feedback from all the money that they put into it. Uh, what, what has happened over the last 300 years is that each generation has slightly got better, independent of losing power. And uh, this, this will... Uh, I think the libertarian case is that we can extend... Of course, it won't make much difference. Uh, you know, uh, 
get rid of the state and making the economic uh, uh, advantage of getting rid of the state mm. will not make uh, very much difference to uh, our average uh, standard of living. Uh, we'll, we'll still get roughly the same sort of progress that we make even under the state, except we will have no wars, we'll have no mass unemployment and so on. That's all. But we'll still have the same sort of problems of... Uh, we'll get richer from generation to generation, uh, 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 but we're doing that even with the state, even with the handicap of the state, mm. uh, and even with the great wastage of wars and the immoral loss of lives and so on, and even with mass unemployment since 1970, we have made progress, but the statisticians in there do you think are very clever, actually hold that the real wage hasn't gone up since 1970, which is, of course, a stupidity. Uh, because the real, the real wage, is, and here Keynes was right, the real wage relates to what it can buy. Now, the things it can buy today weren't even around in 1970, personal mm. computers and the rest of it. So it's, through technological progress, through economic and technological progress, over the last three, uh, 500 years, if you like, the last 1,000 years, each new generation has been slightly better off than the uh, earlier one. That has continued, it has continued despite wars, but getting rid of wars and getting rid of mass unemployment, it will continue just a bit faster. I disagree with so many of the things you've said, David, that it would take a- another couple of hours to take them apart. I, I disagree... I don't think you can take them apart. <laughs> I disagree with your claim that real wages have significantly increased over the past generation or so. I don't well, believe they have. Well, look, you're a Bolshevik. Okay, yeah. look, for, for the price... Yes, of, you're a Bolshevik. No, for the price of a thousand cigarettes, you can have a 60-inch screen television set. Great. But um, w- when I was a boy, my father could go out to work as an electrician and he could earn enough money to run a wife and four children and a car and a mortgage. This was a humble contract electrician who unfortunately, um, well, gone now. Uh, but you know, when I was an estate agent in South London in the 1980s, it was possible for a bus driver to have a wife and children and again a, a mortgage on a semi detached house in, in a rather dumpy area. Now, you know, you could, it doesn't matter how many internet connections you can afford, it doesn't matter how many gigabytes per second you can download, it doesn't matter uh, what shiny electronic toys you can afford. The, the fact remains that ordinary working people are worse off in the most important respects today than they were 30 years ago, uh, and worse off than they were 40 years ago. And I think this is getting worse. Uh, turning back to the cost of power, Oh, I accept that the pursuit of power may be ultimately futile, but the, but, but um, that doesn't. It's rather like drinking a bottle of whiskey a day. If you start drinking a bottle of whiskey a day at the age of twenty, you'll be in rather bad shape by the time you're sixty. But along the way, it's good fun, and power is fun. Power is wonderful. Power is better than sex. It makes sex better. The, the ability to stand up and say to the entire world, look at me, look what I'm doing. The ability to press a button and watch everyone jump simultaneously. It doesn't matter how much it rots your soul in the end. It's so delightful. It's delightful for some. It's, de- it's delightful for the people who pursue it and who are yes, the problem. Uh, but it but may not be delightful for us, but it's delightful for the people who get it and who are willing to risk everything to get it and keep it. But you see, I mean, it's perfectly correct that the housing market has been more messed up in the last few years. But, but, but notwithstanding that, it, it, progress has still been made and people are better off. They're much better off today than, than they were uh, uh, in 1970. Notwithstanding the fact that it, they, they've supported a mass uh, pool of unemployment of over a million. And uh, they needn't have, have supported them at all. All those people could have had jobs all along. Yeah, of course. And you know, the, the housing market could be free. New houses could have... If you had a free market in houses, you wouldn't have the housing problem. So, but nevertheless, I, I don't think that the housing problem is a factor that means, on the whole, there's been no progress. The progress is conspicuous in the last 30 years. And it's due to population growth, of course. Yeah, it, it depends how you measure progress. You know, I, I don't... Look, 
Look at this wonderful. <laughs> look at this wonderful toy here. Yes. Not only uh, not within ordinary people's reach 30 years ago, but uh, probably inconceivable. But yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, your ability to get shiny electrical toys for uh, the price of a few hundred cigarettes does not really compensate for the inability of ordinary people to find any kind of secure family life. Yes, but if you freed the market up, they, they, they would have uh, been able to... Of uh, course they would, but the market uh, hasn't been freed up and it's getting less free. Yeah, but, 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 no, but we stand... Um, it, it is getting less free, but, but nevertheless the standard of living is still going up despite that. Less conspicuously true. Well, we'll have to disagree on that, David. Certainly. Just, just to clarify, obviously you, you look at this whole um, landed aristocracy as a basically a devolution of power, and that's what you're in favour of. Uh, not killing somebody for stealing a rabbit. Mm. Just, just to clarify. Oh, the landed... Okay. It may be that I have a tendency to look at present evils and to think them so much greater than past evils which I have never myself suffered. If you were to move you back 150 years uh, to, into the lifestyle of an ordinary working person in 1860s London, it, it may be that it would have been pretty awful. And that as I saw Lord Flop's carriage go by, uh, and all of these people with tall silk hats uh, and crinoline dresses uh, and lovely dresses and so on. It may, have been, it may be that I'd have been filled with hatred and I'd have sounded thoroughly Jacobin. It may be that I'm a victim of my time and place. But um, even making that allowance, I do think that the rule by the landed aristocracy on balance put us into the best of available worlds and that the demolition of the landed aristocracy during the past hundred years has coincided with our descent into wherever we are now and wherever we are probably still very rapidly headed. Sorry. Is there any, 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 any other speakers? I'm not that happy note. Yes, we've got the bar. Thank you very much indeed, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.